Welcome to this Killick Explains video on how equity investors should think about risk. So by way of background information on this topic, basically many new investors only really focus on one thing, if they're being honest, or perhaps they don't realise that there are other things they could be focusing on, and that is, will my investment go up, ideally, or down? But that price risk is only one part of the picture when it comes to understanding risk in full. Now, by way of an example of how those other risks suddenly reared their ugly heads, if you like, in real life, you have the well-known story now of GameStop. So this is a US games store retailer. Earlier in the year, lots of investors piled into the stock on the strength of Reddit chat, um, hoping to take on the hedge funds who were shorting, betting on falling prices, and a whole army of them piled in, hoping to make a quick buck out of a sudden rise in the stock. And that essentially led a number of them into a sort of trap, if you like. A lot of people didn't realise the full extent of the risks that you run when you're doing single stock investing. In fact, I wouldn't even call it single stock investing, more like single stock gambling. And I want to just highlight some of those other risks now. So price risk is the obvious one. That's where I started. There's a component of price risk called foreign currency risk that a lot of people don't fully appreciate. And with single stocks, you are running two sets of risk, if you like, where you're buying an overseas security. So let's take that one on now. So shares can be volatile. They may rise or fall sharply in their native currency. So a UK investor buying UK stocks, for example. But throw in foreign exchange risk and you've got potentially a double whammy. And I'll just illustrate this very simply. For example, if a pound is invested when the pound dollar exchange rate is one to one, very simplistic example, it could become 50p if the exchange rate moves to one to two, or the dollar weakens, or the pound strengthens. And that's because on retranslation, suddenly your original one dollar back in sterling terms is no longer a pound, it's only 50p. So that is a very simple illustration of the power, if you like, of foreign currency movements. So even when investors consider price risk, they may not be considering all of the price risk that they face. Then you've got liquidity risk, and this is slightly different. So this manifested by many Robin Hood investors not realising, in fairness, some would say, how could they, that the app they were using might freeze if demand for a single stock or a small group of stocks like GameStop breached certain limits. Now, the technical explanation for that is that's because brokers or market participants must maintain a security deposit with clearinghouses. Clearinghouses are there to try and make sure that trades don't fail, especially large volumes of trades. So in this case, the DTCC effectively said, uh, you cannot accept any further orders for the time being until you've upped the level of the security deposit you keep with us. And because it was a huge amount that was required, it took a little bit of scrambling around on the part of Robin Hood to find the necessary funds. Now, the impact of liquidity risk was pretty brutal there. It's to reduce or even negate your ability to trade right at the point when you might need to. And even if it doesn't negate your ability to trade, this was an extreme example of an app effectively closing temporarily, but even if it doesn't do that, bid to offer spreads, which I've covered elsewhere, can suddenly widen, leaving you with a much, much lower return on the trade that you're trying to execute. So liquidity risk is important. Then there's counterparty risk. Now, this is what it sounds like, but a lot of people sort of overlook it or perhaps assume it won't happen to them. So what we've got here on single stocks, this can arise at a country level, political risk, for example, borders closing, capital controls being imposed and so on. Or it can arise institutionally. And there are countless examples of this, but the collapse of Lehman Brothers, what happened to Northern Rock a while back, um, Woodford's woes more recently, have all illustrated the potential for counterparty risk. And potentially, this one is the risk of a loss of capital, which is pretty bad, but it's not the full picture. Because when people get these risks wrong, by which I mean not just price risk, but liquidity risk and counterparty risk, they may jeopardise not only their immediate investment, 
but also their chances of making money in the future. Why? Well, essentially because of something called inflation risk, or opportunity cost risk, if you like. And this is basically saying that when investors get hurt, they often, understandably, run to cash or quickly de-risk their portfolios. Ooh, don't want to run the risk of that happening to me again. And that immediately can expose them to inflation risk, or what I sometimes call opportunity cost risk. Because as an investor, you do need to try and earn a long-term return that's at least at the level of inflation and ideally beats it. So in a worst-case scenario, having... Uh, been burned once, if you like, investors may then run shy of the market and lose out for a considerable period on better returns. So in a worst case, they won't even match inflation if they run to very low cash rates, um, or they may simply underperform where they could have been had they not had that sudden exposure to a short-term burst of risk. So what's the solution to all this? Well, in simple terms, First of all, knowledge is power when it comes to risk. So being aware that there are different types of risk that needs to be managed is part of the, the equation. <clears throat> no risk, no return is still a good rule of thumb. So it's important to realise that if you want to earn sensible long-term returns, there is a level of risk involved. I'm not talking the kind of risk that GameStop buyers took through Robin Hood. That's an almost crazy level of risk. But with a portfolio, you need to bear in mind that there is a trade-off. That can be managed through the correct approach to the portfolio, but nonetheless, it is still a rule of thumb. And a well-diversified portfolio should factor in and balance all four types of risk. That's not to say you'll never be exposed to any of them. Uh, no one can make that promise. Uh, there is always some risk with, for example, an equity-based portfolio. But you can diversify away a good chunk of some of the risks that I've just talked about. And it's a shame that the advent of apps and Robin Hood stories and so on and bandwagon trading is sort of diluting that message, making the market look rather gung-ho, like a kind of casino, if you like. So lots of ground covered there. Editor at killick.com with any questions. If you'd like to watch related videos, we have a library at killick.com forward slash learn and there's a shares tab near the top and if you'd like a copy of my how-to guide it's called how to invest in equities then ping me at editor at and we'll get that organized for you <laughs>